Howdy listeners, as we all know, planet Earth has 7.5 billion people and 7.4 billion of those people have small businesses. Now to be fair, numbers that size can be hard to envision and to be even fairer, most of what I just said is entirely made up. But I'll tell you what isn't made up, Keep. Keep is the all-in-one client management software designed specifically for small businesses. Keep takes the most annoying and laborious parts of running a small business and metaphorically tosses them into the sun. Stop grinding yourself to death with busy work and repetitive tasks. Let Keep integrate your customer follow-ups, messaging automation, next-level appointment setting, and so much more. Head over to Keep.com and start your free trial of Keep Grow, Keep Pro, or for those looking for something beefier, talk to one of our coaches about Infusionsoft, the product that started it all. More business, less work, that's Keep. Just go to Keep.com to start your free trial. That's K-E-A-P.com. One more time, that's K-E-A-P.com. Okay, well, we'll be ready if you stop chatting. (laughs) Just kidding. Ducey knows I love him. Okay, okay, gentlemen. I want to hear about your great weekend plans. Ducey was teeing it up earlier, Jack. So what do you got going on this weekend? Well, um, <clears throat> something I feel very strongly about, actually. Uh... <laughs> oh! Yeah, we do have to come in with the intro to the podcast. Oh, okay. Okay. That's my fault. Jeez. I'm so messed up. No. Yeah, good. Because then I would have to fake a reaction and I'm not someone who lies. So, Okay, so hi, I'm Crystal. I'm Jack. And this is Small Biz Buzz. So let's get into it. I'm dying to hear because this has been teased for a bit and we've been waiting for this moment to share it. What are you doing this weekend, Jack? Um, I have been uh, forced into a co-ed baby shower. Mm. Okay, so <laughs> sounds dreadful. It, dun, it's dun, dun. yeah. Oh, good <laughs> God! Right now, what guy point to him that said when he heard about a baby shower and said, "Man, I wish I was invited to that." I'm going to be real honest. I don't know a lot of women. Oh gosh, <laughs> Deucey's raising his hand. <laughs> I was just about to say I don't even know any women that actually like going to a shower. So if I was a man, I think it would be worse because women, at least tend to be a little bit more like, okay, well, we've got to rally for our friend, but showers are freaking boring. Yeah. But go on. Right. Not no. many men so and not yeah, many women. My, uh, it's my wife's, uh, it's actually family, but it's my wife's best friend, my, my cousin, but her literally, literally her best friend. And uh, I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be sick that day. <laughs> and uh, she said that, uh, <laughs> she said she would be disappointed in me Ooh, if I was sick the that D word. day. Yeah, that's the only D word that comes off after that D word is divorce. Right. And you're so, not getting there with your great wife. No. And I, uh, <laughs> there, there will be like certain benefits to my marriage that I won't get for a while if I don't go to this. You better go. So yeah, so I'm going. Don't lose benefits. And that's actually, a, Brent, we have Brendan, uh, Brendan Allen Barrett with us. And uh, you just had a, a child recently. I so, did. Yeah. We're like six, seven. I should know better, but he's either six or seven weeks in. <laughs> he's so cute. I'm going to have to see an updated picture because although I don't like showers, I do like babies. Yeah. So I don't want people to think I'm like vicious. <laughs> well, um, my, my weekend is filled with making up for all the time I've been at work, not doing my daddy duties and fair. letting wife sleep. <laughs> okay, I know. About, if I can talk her into it. How about, how about your baby shower? I, I don't even. I, I was. I don't even. I wasn't <laughs> even wanted, aware it was happening. Just answer. a gift showed up, and exactly. I was like, "Cool, that's less stuff I got to buy." Awesome. You weren't invited, <laughs> which is the way it should be. It you should. weren't invited. My sister just had a shower two weeks ago, but I don't have kids, as I think I told you last time. Um, and she has these great sister in laws that love her, and they mm-hmm. have like kids, so they do all the work. I just showed up, which still, like I said, was painful. This time it was easy because it wasn't too showery, but yeah, those showers get crazy. So let's get to what we're talking about today because <laughs> we're like starting to go down a rabbit hole of misery and showers. <laughs> but uh, we have Brendan Allen Barrett here, and you're like, pretty known out there for killing it in sales. So go ahead and tell everyone all the things you do. Cause to be honest, I wouldn't even know where to start. You have so many 
businesses, jobs, like things you're working mm -hmm. on for sales, you're definitely an expert. So go ahead and share so that we make sure we get it the way you like it <laughs> and I don't mess up. <laughs> well, we'll keep it real simple. Yeah, I'm the founder of Start in Phoenix or startinphoenix.com, which is home to all kinds of uh, training and content on best practices in sales and sales leadership. It's also home to uh, the Business of Family and Selling podcast, which you know interviews people who are doing it better than a lot of folks when it comes to uh, sales and sales leadership, but more importantly, the best practices that enable, you know, healthy work life balance or integration. So, <laughs> so important. I don't even have a family. I literally don't know how people do it. I can't even balance my own life without a family. <laughs> so my dog doesn't get enough time. <laughs> so these are like, she really doesn't. And she makes sure I know when she's not. Um, but also it's just hard to make sure you're getting enough rest. I I'm still tired. I told you last time how tired I was. I'm still feeling tired. For a lot of people, it's, uh, you know, just like invention, it, it comes from necessity, right? Yeah. And uh, there is v the baby effect is a very real thing. Oh, yeah. for <laughs> sure. <laughs> the birth of my first son, you know, definitely changed my perspective on a lot of things. And it became very clear that, hey, you know, I can't That's be great. the rep who's working 12, 16 hours a day because I don't have 12, 16 hours a day to do it anymore. So yeah. I better get real smart and intentional about how I'm going about building a book of business, generating revenue for the companies that I'm representing. Uh, and so then down the rabbit hole, I went into best practices and sales and how do That's I get great. really good at this so that, you know, I can fit it in between eight and 5 p.m. That's <laughs> you pretty know, 8 good. 5 p.m. And getting a solid three hours of sleep a night, right? <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Indeed. Indeed. You are really, you must be a great husband because you've mentioned a few times about how your wife's not getting as much sleep as you, but you always put it back on what she's doing, which I think is really cool and uh, stands out as a family man. Oh, she's she's a saint. She carries, you know, so much of, of the weight. And uh, I think, you know, that that was clear from the beginning that that's the kind of person she was going to be. I'm that's like, great. yeah, she, you know, I'm planning to have a family. This is a good partner to do that with. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Well, one of the ways you've gotten smarter, worked smarter, not harder, is really <laughs> looking at sales follow-up, right? Indeed, yeah. And you're kind of really focused in on B2B, mm -hmm. although you've had probably experience in both. Oh, yeah. So what are some main things that small business out there should really be considering when they're thinking of following up with B2B? Well, going back to necessity, like it is a necessity. Um, I think uh, what Discover Org just did like an internal, I don't know if they just did it, but <laughs> uh, internal um, uh, study on, you know, what does it take just to get that first demo? How many yeah. times do you have to touch a prospect just to win their attention and have a legitimate conversation? What they found over tens of thousands of demos booked was that their average was seven touches. So a combination right. of phone calls, email, social media touches, just to have that conversation to say yes or no, we're going to do this thing. Uh, and I think, you know, seven for, you know, if you're not good at it, it might take more than seven, right? Well, and I think seven only accounts for the ones you knew you saw. Yeah. You know, a lot of times I think marketing today is so sly. Um, you don't always know you even saw it. So mm -hmm. there probably is more than that, but mm -hmm. seven that someone will remember. Mm -hmm. Sure. And that's, you know, we're talking five to seven just to get people engaged with you in a meaningful way in the sales conversation. Yep. And, and then, you know, and, and then there's your, your sales process. Yeah. Jack, but, you know all about oh, this. Oh man. Yeah. Just getting people uh, engaged just to get people engaged with you. Mm -hmm. You're talking five to seven people balk at that mm -hmm. all the time. We mm -hmm. cover that in, uh, I've covered that in one, one-on-one -on -one with small businesses in my webinars mm -hmm. uh, and live demo, like people balk at the idea of having to follow up that often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Well, that that often and that, you know, that many times in a short period of time, I, a lot, it does surprise a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, I think my first wake up to that was one of my first sales gigs. I was painting houses, over, you know, between my junior and senior year of college. Yeah. And like, um, I got a call from my, my manager and he's like, Brendan, you've gone through more marketing material than anybody. You're working hard, but like, why aren't you getting as many quotes out as everybody else? And the reality was I was spreading myself too thin. I was focusing mm. on too large of an area and not touching the same people multiple times. And so I was burning through my collateral and not getting as many meetings as people who went back to the same neighborhood three, four, five times. Yeah, that's right? interesting. Um, 
it always makes you wonder because there's all kinds of marketing thinking mm-hmm. of door to door that's a great call out i would not have thought about going to the same neighborhood multiple times but mm-hmm. that's exactly how these touch points started right they used to start by getting in front of the actual person well a good example of that is i interviewed um the guys at four energy or one of the guys over at four energy uh you know they do uh, energy efficient windows, doors, uh, solar insulation, right? And so they're targeting homeowners, right? People who just moved in, older house typically, right? Uh, so their first t- like their first touch is telemarketing. They're calling into a neighborhood, then they're working that neighborhood by knocking on the doors. If you don't get somebody to answer, you leave a door hanger or a flyer mm-hmm. in the door. Uh, then when you get a job, then there's two appointments. Both those trucks are wrapped with company logos. <laughs> when you get the job, then the sign is in the front yard, and then you keep working those houses around that sign and around that job. Right, you canvass that neighborhood. Yeah, you're, you're building momentum upon all of those exposures to your brand to your message and as you get a customer now you have something new to bring to the conversation hey now we're working with somebody you know somebody in your neighborhood who's got a house exactly like yours because it was built by the same person yeah right and so you know there are people who are going to be the low-hanging fruit and through follow-up you can build upon those experiences and make your the thing you sell whether it's a service or or a product that much more relatable to The laggards, the people who are (laughs) harder to win over. Totally. Um, So what you're just saying, though, is a lot of B2C. So if we Mm -hmm. think B2B, sometimes it's tough to get one touch point with a Mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. So how can someone really get to those touch points through working business contacts? Like, Mm -hmm. what are some of the ways people are getting in front of B2B clients? People are people. And like one thing, like when we when we talk follow up, some of the pushback is, well, it's so expensive to send a rep back to that office. Sure three, four, five times. It's like, well, I'm not telling you to send them three, four, five times. Like, let's place a call, send a couple of emails, see if we can win their attention. Then if if still we can't win their attention and have a meaningful conversation, then maybe we deploy somebody to go out. And when we do that, let's plan the route. (laughs) That's smart. So you're hitting up lots in the same area. Lots of, you know, as many people in the same area on the same day who we've already exhausted some of these other things. And now we have maybe content or collateral or touch points that we can refer back to. Cause while we're prospecting into an account, like, you know, on every call, there's something that can be learned. It's really cool if the thing that we learn is, hey, this person's as excited as I am to buy the thing I have to sell, <laughs> right? But typically it's, hey, you know, on the first call, you know, I tried to talk to Michelle. She's not the person I got to tell, talk to Michael. On the second call, yeah. you know, I captured Michael's email address. So now I don't just have a way to call him. I can follow up with an email and now they can hear what I have to say and read what I have to say. And, you know, I can bump it up in their inbox a couple of times and I can mm-hmm. Now I captured the cell phone because they replied to an email and now oh, we're playing the scheduling smoothing. game. But right. now I can now I can send now because I have an email signature with a cell phone in it, now I can start sending text messages. Oh, and, oh they're really responsive to text messages because maybe nobody else is texting them, right? And yeah. so, you know, you're learning all these things and you're collecting, you know, a lot of people when especially when we're going into you know, follow up for first meetings, prospecting into an account with all of these touches, uh, a lot of people, you know, they think when you say that they hear cold calling and just like spray and pray but the reality is prospector like if you think of the term like gold prospector they weren't going out there blindly right they're prospecting though ever they're they're panning they're panning (laughs) for gold to find deposits right one little nugget a place (laughs) worth digging really deep yeah because that's where the real gold is that's where the real material is but you don't want to dig a real deep hole and waste you know, six months worth of work and food and time, unless you got an indication that that's the place to dig. So right. what's the fool's gold of sales follow-up for B2B? Because that fool's gold will get you every time. <laughs> Suddenly you're digging the big hole and it wasn't worth your time. Mm. The time vampires for sure. <laughs> Agreed. People who'll talk with you and like, you know, if you've got a sales team of a couple of people and you're tracking talk time and that's one of your metrics that you're, mm-hmm. you know, a salesperson oh, yeah. would will love talking for 20 minutes to somebody who has no authority. Oh, that's such a <laughs> because, broken metric. Yeah, their oh. talk time looks fantastic. Yeah, yeah, but can't make a sale. So how do you spot a time vampire coming a mile away? 
Um, well, like the rule with prospecting and follow up is questions. You know, um, you're going for engagement, but if you're asking the right questions, you can tell like this is yeah, this is engagement for their benefit versus engagement for my benefit. And you should be a decent person and a nice person, enjoy the work that you do. Uh, but at a certain point, yeah, you should know when to cut your losses and. Uh, through questions, through knowing, you know, asking questions, because even if they're not a champion, they mm -hmm. could be a coach through that account. Yeah. Right. You know, they could they could tell you who really pulls the strings, right? And then you have to be honest with yourself and know, okay, I've got what I've got or, or I can get from this specific individual. They've coached me as much as they can coach me. Now I got to go execute on yeah. that information. Back right. in the day, I did do some sales um, and I actually was pretty damn good at it. But darn good. Maybe I just got a bleep. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I think Cam's I think okay. But I wasn't selling, you know, I wasn't selling B2B. I wasn't selling some services. I was mm -hmm. selling family portraits. Um, but I think one of the things I always found is that there are time vampires mm -hmm. and you have to be daring enough to ask bold questions to start identifying what what their interest level really is. Mm -hmm. Like what's stopping you from buying this extra portrait package? Mm -hmm. You know, is it that you don't like the portrait? Cause then let's cut our losses. Mm -hmm. Take this other one and let's go. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes in B2B, we get nervous to ask the tough questions because you don't want to burn the bridge, mm -hmm. but sometimes they're just not ready. I, I was always shocked when you'd ask a more serious follow-up question and you'd find out they're either just sometimes just waiting on getting answers from other people. And that's great, that you can handle. Then it's like, okay, well, I'm gonna check in with you. Mm -hmm. Does two weeks sound good? Mm -hmm. And then you know when to check back and you're not waiting those two weeks, hitting mm -hmm. them up every day. But what are some good questions that people can ask to kind of identify if they should continue following up or should they cut their losses? Okay, well, here's a linkable moment for you. Cause you know, when I was talking to, or when I was here last time talking with Clay, right? Like one of his big insights was you have to ask for the business, mm -hmm. oh, right? Yeah. If you're just tiptoeing around it, yeah. <laughs> at a certain point, you got to ask for the business or you're not going to get a yes or a no. And you know, if it's, if you spend a decent amount of time, it, it's time, you know, if you've spent a decent amount of time exploring it and you haven't asked for the business, yeah, you haven't got given somebody a chance to cut you loose, you know, as somebody who's selling to them. Yeah. Like that no could be the permission. Okay, finally, I can leave this person alone right. and go focus on some somebody who mm -hmm. I can actually do business with. Right. Yeah, and, and I think you, that's Yeah, good. you brave up. And then if it is a no, you get a reason. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. a, a no mm -hmm. isn't always a solid no. It may be a no right now or mm -hmm. maybe a no depends. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's it's uh, a no is great. A yeah. yes is great. Uh, a maybe is like not where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Totally. Well, so asking why, right? Uh, well, timing's not right. Well, what would make it right? Right? Mm -hmm. Is it is it that you don't have time to do it right now? Is it's like, oh, I need three weeks. Well, why do you need three weeks? It's, well, in three weeks, I'll think I'll be done with this project. Yeah. What would help you get that project done sooner? Can I connect you with anybody? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> There's that expert shining his light. Right. Okay, so we're going to take a break and kick it on over to worst business ideas ever. So hopefully you enjoy that and then stick around. We're gonna talk some more with Brendan on some more follow-up and how he balances it all. So thanks, come, or I guess hang out a little longer and listen. Howdy folks, I'm Derek Haru. And I'm Ducey Van Dusen. And this is Worst Business Ideas in History. The show where we look back at some of the most brutal missteps, failures, and flops in consumer history. And make fun of it. But also learn something. Nope, it says in my contract I don't have to learn. Uh, fi fine, uh, the rest of us will learn something and you can just mock people's misfortune. Sounds good. <sighs> Welcome to the Worst Business Ideas in History. Hi, I'm Derek Haru. And I'm Ducey Van Dusen. And this is Worst Business Ideas in History. What are we looking at today? We're going to look at a couple of uh, interesting topics that I'm excited about, which is the war between HD, DVD, and Blu-ray. Okay. These are, uh, anybody who listened to the football episode, I know a little bit more about these things. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've seen the format wars in the past. There was VHS versus Betamax. There was, uh, you know, Laserdisc tried to take off and didn't really go anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And DVD came along. 
Um, DVD kind of ruled the roost for quite a while. But then it was uh, in the early 2000s, we got these two competing formats, HD DVD, which was produced primarily by Toshiba, Mm -hmm. and Blu-ray, which was produced primarily by Sony. Mm -hmm. So um, some of the factors in the VHS versus beta debacle was just adoption by things like video rental stores and the ability to tape things off of TV for long play. You know, the amazing thing about all of these, uh, all of these wars is usually the, whichever format has the best quality is kind of irrelevant to whichever wins out over time. (laughs) Absolutely. Like beta, beta is an absolutely both on an audio and video standard preferable to VHS. What VHS had over beta was that you could record over two hours on a single tape, which a lot of people, what they were using it for was to tape things like football games or other sporting events. Movies that would air. Yep. Movies, uh, which if you remember, if you were a child of the eighties, every time there would be like a TV ad for say like the Hobbit on VHS, (laughs) they would be like, do you want this in VHS or beta? And like, if you got it on beta, it came on two tapes. Oh, wow. So, uh, Blu-ray is going head-to-head with HD DVD, and the first thing that happens is Toshiba and Microsoft team up, and they're like, we're both backing HD DVD. We think it's going to work better for personal computers. Um, what we find out eventually is that really neither n- neither was adopted for for. PC use like Blu-ray, like most most uh, personal computers, just never shipped with either an HD DVD player or a Blu-ray, or a Blu-ray player. player. Yeah, I mean, you know, so obviously CD players and DVDs eventually became a really big thing uh, on computers. Not so much nowadays, as discs are kind of becoming you know a thing of the past slowly. But uh, yeah, it never really, despite the huge amount of storage space that both these formats had, it just uh, didn't seem to pick up. I guess the internet came. Uh, broadband came too soon. Yeah, that's that's always. I actually was a very staunch believer that I was going to skip the Blu-ray format altogether, but it stuck around long enough to where I yeah, kind of had around, to adopt. I, I, I'm kind of with you. It's been around longer than I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm just going to wait till everything's 1080p streaming, and then I won't care about this. And now everything's 4K, and that's a whole other. <laughs> that's a different show. So, um, uh, both sides are trying to get people on their side. And the first place most of them go is the studios. So HD DVD had Universal, Paramount, and Warner Brothers on their side. Meanwhile, Sony uh, was backing Blu-ray as well as uh, Walt Disney and 20th Century Fox were on board. Now, both of those have pretty wide movie and uh, TV because this was a time when like people were getting excited about owning entire TV shows on disc so they could just play them whatever they want. Right sit home and binge watch you know the simpsons on a sunday or lost or i lost. had all of lost i had all of uh 24 <laughs> i can't believe i binged those on dvds so uh what ends up happening is that steven spielberg actually ends up playing a huge role in this whole thing so he's tied to warner brothers at the time who is backing hd dvd but he specifically stipulated that his movies had to be available on blu-ray which immediately eroded their partnership. And in yeah. short order, Warner Brothers ends up jumping ship. So now uh, Blu-ray has Warner Brothers on their side in addition to Sony, Fox, and Disney. So they've got all the powerhouses with the, sh- with the exception of Paramount. That first defector, always the, it's got to have people worried as soon as you start to see that. Absolutely. And then the, next, the very next thing that happens is uh, Blockbuster Video after they have, you know, they, they test out both in some, tar- in some target markets. Mm-hmm. And after, you know, six months, a year of testing, they're like, well, 70% of our sales are going to Blu-ray. So we're stocking our shelves with Blu-rays. And that's where the, the holes in the hull of HD DVD really start to show. Um, they try to get a little bit of traction by uh, pairing up with Microsoft and the Xbox 360 comes out and the Xbox 360 is a fairly qualified success. And they offer a peripheral, which is an external HD DVD an, an, player. An add-on, which I completely, I, in my head, it was part of the system. No, you had to go buy an add-on, plug it in to the side. It would sit there. Correct. And it was almost $200. I remember it was like $150 or $200. And that's wow. after you have already bought uh, an, an Xbox, Xbox 360. 360. Um, meanwhile, Sony, who owns the Blu-ray format, 
the PlayStation 3 comes out, so guess what's pre-installed in it? Not as a peripheral, built into the system. You buy a PlayStation 3, you've got a Blu-ray player. Now these PlayStations, I mean, they sold really well, the PlayStation 3, but they were super expensive, especially those first few years that they were out. Weren't they like 400 or even 500 for different models? Like- yeah, absolutely. And so like you could make the case, you're like, well, after you spend all the money, they cost about the same. Consumer mindset can be an odd thing to track. <laughs> and so even though the PS3 was more expensive, because the Blu-ray was bundled in, people who actually didn't have much interest in video games were buying it because it was actually slightly cheaper than a lot of the standalone Blu-ray Blu-ray players players, that were being put out. Now, Sony did this. This is a fun fact for for everyone listening. Sony loses money every single time they sell a console. The PlayStation 3, the PlayStation 4, they lose money every single single time they sell a console. And that's like... And they sell a lot of them. <laughs> like, yeah, they lose no joke. In how do they? Like, how does that work? How does that help them? So they lose anywhere from a hundred to one hundred and fifty dollars every time they sell a PlayStation Three. They get it back when you buy games. What they're really doing is they're paying one hundred and fifty bucks to gain entry into your living room. So but they're it, they're the original um, cheap printer, expensive ink. Correct. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Things just start sliding from there. Target follows suit. They're only carrying Blu-ray in their stores. Uh, Warner Brothers, then, you know, one of the last holdouts, like Warner Brothers, as I said, jumps ship and is is uh, pairing up with Blu-ray. Uh, HD DVD producer Toshiba tries dropping. They actually slash the prices of their players in half, hoping that it'll spur adoption. But by that time, you know, the damage is done. There's nothing they can do. So what I immediately think of when trying to apply, like, look at this situation, like that loss leader idea really stood out to me. Um, and there are a lot of companies that will do this, that they'll sell something, you know, Walmart will sell something um, at a loss, not because there's, you know, something specifically tied to it, but just because it gets them into the, the store, it gets consumers into the store, and then they pick up other stuff while they're there and they make up their money there. So how can a small business apply that idea? Like small businesses don't have a lot to just give away. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to look for places where you can provide people with value that doesn't necessarily have to cost you a lot of money, but you may be giving it away. And that may be in instructional videos and, you know, uh, online content, blogs, tip sheets, white papers, that kind of thing. You know, and something else that you can do as a step into, so there's there's that free stuff, but you can also... Um, have an ebook or a webinar series or something like that that is, you know, 20 bucks to buy. And that kind of gets people in the door starting a relationship with you. And then they're more likely to come back to you later after you've made that kind of initial transaction. And the thing you want to make sure of is that it's things that aren't going to cost you time and effort. If you're giving away something that is, uh, that you personally have to uh, follow up on or do a service that you have to give that battle's never going to end in your favor. So yeah, find something that you can give away that doesn't cost you time or effort besides getting it up and running first to start to create a relationship with people that might be interested in your service. Absolutely. Well, we want to thank you guys for tuning in. This has been Derek Haru. This is Ducey Van Dusen. And this is Worst Business Ideas in History. Bye. Keeping ever-expanding client info straight, sending the same emails hundreds of times, scheduling and rescheduling appointments over and over. Who enjoys this nonsense? No one, except my cousin Brent, and Brent is the absolute worst. Keep is the premier all-in-one CRM. Just head over to keep.com, that's K-E-A-P dot com, and start your free trial today. Get the busy work out of the way so you can focus on what's important and make your small business grow with Keep. Start your free trial at Keep.com. That's K-E-A-P dot com. More business, less work. That's Keep. Okay, we're back. And uh, we are... Here with uh, Brendan Allen Barrett, and we're going to continue our conversation. And we're uh, we kind of segued over from uh, follow up, and uh, and then crossing over into um, sales and uh, work life balance. Yeah. So how do you do it? I don't know. So a little fairy dust, a <laughs> little 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 blind luck. It caffeine. seems like something you would need Lots to make caffeine. that happen. No. So that w- I mean that topic alone was the 
ultimately the spark that started the podcast, the business of family and selling. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was, I was an independent sales rep for a construction company and I was driving out to a job in Wickenburg at 1030 at night, you know, listening to an audio book that my wife and I had decided to listen to together. You know, that right there was, just, you know, trying to consume some of the same content. That yeah. was a step in that direction of work-life balance. Because um, I think I heard Seth Godin say at first that, you know, when you read the same books as people, your conversations start to change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really true. You start to have a vocabulary from which to have, or a common vocabulary from which to have really productive conversations, no matter what it is. In that particular situation, it was, you know, me and my soon to be wife, like, how the heck are we going to merge our finances? How do we navigate yeah. that? And we're, st we're still doing it. I just suggested another book this week that, you know, we should be reading together so that we can start, you know, making more plans for the future and refining that. But um, again, that was the, this work life balance thing. And, you know, being self-employed and a sales professional, like those are long, stressful days. They can be, especially if you're not super intentional about yeah. it. Uh, and so there came the podcast, The Business of Family and Selling, where I interviewed a bunch of people who were farther into fatherhood and farther into marriage than I was, who, That's cool. you know, were doing really big things or, you know, had one or two pieces of the equation really w well figured out. And uh, yeah, I mean, really the, the big themes were boundaries, but to set good boundaries, you got to have some pretty good clarity. Uh, and, and then the other part of it is uh, best practices, yeah. right? Like the, the things that work really well right now are the things that are going to give you time back, right. right? So whether it's organizing your day, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to prospecting activity, following up on existing pipeline, uh, you know, getting paperwork done, yeah. right? Like doing that really well and keeping it organized and efficient is going to make it easier for you to feel good about clock, air quotes, clocking out at five totally. o'clock and focusing on the people at the dinner table. And then like as a sales leader, you know, having... <clears throat> processes and procedures documented both written and then maybe in more consumable mm -hmm. fashions like video and audio so that salespeople don't have to feel like they need to call their boss to get a question answered or to learn how <laughs> yeah. to do something you know the boss is already laid out when you have these questions search this database i'll show you how to do it yeah. in the video i created two years ago right right uh so that's you know that was the podcast and again the lessons learned are clarity boundaries and then always trying to revise best practices so they truly are the most efficient ways of growing revenue and leading a team that's good right and systematizing so you essentially yeah yeah for, yeah for yourself and for like your team members or yeah so i mean if you're if you're going at every day you're shooting from the hip every morning yeah <laughs> right like there's no consistency to that not only are you going to be frustrated and at the end of the day feel like you didn't accomplish anything and then feel guilty about air quotes, clocking out mm -hmm. at five o'clock and sitting with the family. Uh, but you have no data from which then to reflect on and try to make pivots and improvements upon. Yeah. Right. I, I think the last time I was here, we were talking about being super organized and, you know, documenting your sales processes and your follow ups in your CRM. Mm -hmm. Right. Because only when you document everything and you document things accurately, are you really going to have true data from which to make decisions and improvements from totally. and the same thing applies to uh, you know making time for both being a, a fantastic provider um, getting your feelings of self-actualization from your career and also being you know a, yeah. a, a good husband wife parent child brother sister whatever it happens to be mm -hmm. right. i feel like for small business owners it's so tough because you're you're <laughs> agreed. <laughs> You're trying so hard. <laughs> I don't know what that sign means, Jack. Help a girl out. It's audio. They can't see the facial expressions, guys. <laughs> I don't know what this means yet. We need a sign language lesson after so no, I can no, pick I... up on the cues Jack gives me. <laughs> oh my! Like my fingers are my pocket. My fingers went numb. I wasn't. Making oh, a sign. it wasn't even a sign. I'm like, what did I do wrong? I'm doing this. Okay, so back to this. <laughs> topic I didn't forget guys what I was talking about is that small business owners 
really find the struggle to balance that mm-hmm. family and life and, and business. Mm-hmm. And whether it's a family or you're just on your own, you still need a work-life balance. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a friend, actually, I've been giving him a lot of feedback lately that, hey, you're going 110 miles an hour 24-7. You need to take some time out and make a little time for something outside your business because Mm -hmm. he's very successful, he's doing great things, but at the end of the day, you still need that time for yourself to grow in other ways as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess what would be a tip you would give to my friend, June Tay, if you're listening, but I would say, what would you tell him about really managing his work-life balance? What would that tip be? Like the number one thing he should be trying to do. What is your fear if the, if June doesn't take this? June Tay? I don't have any fear. I just want everyone to live like a balanced life. Mm-hmm. I think he's killing it. So taking time to celebrate is also part of mm-hmm. continuing on to big goals. Mm-hmm. So, but I also think on this, all the small businesses we've talked to, this is a struggle they find of it's not a nine to five. If you want to succeed, you're probably yeah. working so many hours. So it's a if you can't clock out at five, what should they be at least making sure they do to make sure they have a healthy, sorry, work-life balance? Um, well, like one thing for myself right now is uh, focusing on my eating. Because I tried to make the physical fitness, like mm-hmm. the physical activity shift first and I was successful with that for a while and then not so successful and then everything was a yeah. mess so <laughs> like take the early I've wins never been there at all right never <laughs> take take the early wins right so yeah. like right now it for me it's it's just eating more you know whole foods and, and vegetables and making that my first choice over uh, you know a, a sandwich yeah. <laughs> right That's all this great. processed stuff and and french fries from Wendy's that I can get in you know a minute rather than having to wait five minutes for my steamed uh you know vegetables to be ready Mm -hmm. right um so um i don't know like circle back to the why though yeah right because for me like i want to do all these things but to do that i'm gonna have to live you know a decently long life you know to see my grandkids and give my grandkids the lives that you know i want i foresee them to Mm -hmm. have you know talking about that on a regular basis is important right because if you're not revisiting it yeah you forget about it you focus on the now so i guess focus on the why first and then two take the easy wins what can like what is the easiest thing that you can do and then build upon those wins uh i think like even zuckerberg preaches that kind of stuff right like they did the easy stuff first and that's what allowed them to get build momentum and now do things that you know a lot of people wouldn't have ever dreamed that they'd be able to do yeah you know listing Okay, so I'm I'm not organized. I've never been organized. I'm the guy when you said, "Hey, be able to get up and they shoot from the hip." I'm like, "That's uh, that's me." Mm-hmm. Um, but you usually get the bullseye. Right, I do okay there. <laughs> uh, but I just like recently started listing. My wife is really organized, and her whole life is lists and mm-hmm. checking boxes and feeling really good about kicking the crap out of her lists. I've never been a listing guy until recently and it's made a huge difference Mm -hmm. because if I just try and keep something in my head which I've done for a long time and then I realize (laughs) hey my head is like it's not a very good organizer yep it's all over the place like I drift in the best of times right (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, so actually having lists and writing something like oh I need to do this and now I'm going to write it down amen maybe like that that's what my book is yeah the only thing I brought in were my keys my phone (laughs) and my notebook yeah right I carry that thing with me every day next to yours I sit down (laughs) you know while I'm drinking my coffee or when I first get to my desk if it was a rushed morning and brain dump all the things that I got going on in my head a lot of it is from pages before like it just you know it it never happened whatever and then after it's all out then I start numbering it yeah. What's the mo- like? What's the most important thing I get done today, or what's going to like make me feel accomplished at the end of the day? The thing that's going to move that needle the most—that's number one, right. number two, number three—and then <laughs> you know, if I if I do more than three, then I start to get distracted, so I try to only do three at a time. And if I get through all three, which some days doesn't even happen, yeah. right. but if I get through all three, then I can renumber. Yeah, like uh, um, I don't know if you can, uh, Jordan Peterson. Uh, I read uh, one of his books recently, The Twelve Rules for Life, and he has a conversation with himself where he says, "Hey, self, I'd like to reduce some of the unnecessary suffering around here. <laughs> what is there something I can do?" And he has this conversation with himself, and yeah. so I, I look at that list with that in mind. I'm like, so which of these are causing me the most pain? 
Mm-hmm. You know, where's the most consternation here and which mm-hmm. one should I probably knock off the list mm-hmm. so that uh, that I don't need the Xanax. You guys are <laughs> you guys are speaking in book language here. I'm going to go ahead for anyone out there that might be like me and I'm going to speak to a meme. Because that's what social media marketing <laughs> managers do. The one that always gets me to sit and reevaluate is the one that has the lady and she's got her hand up and she's like, raise your hand if you've been personally victimized by your own bad decisions. <laughs> Anytime someone posts that, I like ra- I put the emoji of the woman with the raised hand because I'm like, amen. That's how I get to reevaluate those choices because I'm like, they are right. I'm personalizing or I'm personally victimizing myself right now by sitting here and eating this, you know, ice cream or by skipping the gym or by not prioritizing those things that I need to really recharge journaling. I have started journaling a little. It's foreign to me, but it is important, I think, for me to clear that headspace and get realigned to like some of my goals and missions in life. Mm -hmm. And so things like that, I think, really help. But some of our best stories come from our worst decisions. I'm just saying. Oh, and the best lessons. <laughs> best stories have, and best lessons. I have so many great stories. <laughs> Me too, Jack. Because I've made horrible decisions. <laughs> Me too. Like, we, yeah, let, no, let's do that. Yeah. And then it goes so Let's south. do the sharing of those too. I'm like ready. <laughs> Who wants to hear? I was just sharing one actually yesterday. I should have called you over. I was like, everyone was really enjoying it, but we're not going to share that here. <laughs> um, but I'll fill you in. Right. But you are 100% right. Those those are the best stories, and they are usually, for me, the best learning experiences. Well, and for those out there, like that is the trend, <laughs> right? Like without conflict, there is no story. But uh, I was just listening to an interview. Um, I think it was Dak Shepard was interviewing Judd Apatow, mm-hmm. right? Um, That's you know, got to be a good one. Yeah, and he f- followed the Avid brothers around for I don't know how long, and they were filming Lucky and filming him. and filming, and couldn't find the conflict they're like where is the story and it took them you know forever to realize that is the story there is these two brothers who like do this awesome thing together and they they don't fight i don't believe it (laughs) and like it's a beautiful thing and they have a fantastic life like they didn't get in deep enough they didn't go in the right closed door i'm telling you right now there's no way two siblings go a whole this amount of years in the industry with no fighting well i get like not to not to the degree that you would you would think it is story worthy i guess but like their whole thing is right like they go to their dad like that he checks them you know when they butt heads Mm -hmm. it's not you know it's not a knockdown drag out fight it's you know hey we're struggling with this thing let's go to our corners reassess maybe we got to get some outside counsel and usually and i think one of the like usually it's their dad telling them to like just man up and quit being a jerk and like accept that that's the way it is (laughs) well they've either spent a lot of money in therapy long before this guy was following them or their dad is a therapist because all i'm saying is my sister knows where all the dead bodies are buried she knows where everything is and most of the time I think she wouldn't sell me out but every once in a while I'm like hmm who would you how much it <laughs> might only take a 20 chiclets. yeah it might only take a 20 <laughs> and she might share all of it on they're, some given days yeah. <laughs> they're also at an age right <laughs> that like in their relationship I think they're at an age in their relationship because they've known each other since birth that a lot of people won't get to Unless until it's their Ever. spouse and they're like in their nineties, <laughs> right? Or they're just very mature, and I'm never going to be that. Well, I would imagine as kids they weren't as peaceful, right? I but would. like you learn and you grow, oh, sure. right? Like I've been married two years now, right? And uh, like that, I mean, we're learning stuff about each other every day, and but we're also being very conscious yeah. about that. And anytime I get like into a like. <laughs> it's oh yeah like we're learning how to you know coexist right? yeah. we're learning how to do this thing called life together and yeah. we are two different people we came from two different places uh and part of that is you know why i was so attracted to you know the woman who became my wife and yeah. the other part of it and like that's i guess growing up in in marriage and growing up in business is very similar right you're gonna butt heads with the people you do business with oh yeah my, my wife my wife wants to shake me till my ears bleed at least once every other day his yeah. wife is like honestly so supportive she's very cool chick she is lovely yeah and, and when we do lives with jack she's <laughs> one of the first people viewing 
And then she immediately like waves or says hi. She's commenting on there. I'm like, oh my gosh, what a social media marketing manager's dream come true. There you go. Right. And, and it's not that she's not busy. She's a pediatric nurse. So yeah. She's busy. <laughs> yeah, actually, you sh- yeah. yeah, what are your tips for balancing life? Because it's kind of interesting to me. You've got a whole family. You're married. Um, I'm curious about you've got a boss lady as a wife. You're a boss man here. So how do you guys balance that life at home too? Um, we, uh, because we're both super A-type, we collide hard. When we, when we collide, it's, it's, and, and jokingly, it's, we fight for the pants. <laughs> and we're not it's it's not overt that we're fighting for the pants sometimes it's it's clear like, yeah and it's other times it's covert not. that we're fighting for the pants and sometimes it's just right out there and we're we're we've been together about eight years um and we're a lot better at it that's great but we still collide because we're both like super a type and you know, to Brendan's point, it probably and my takes way is always better to get and, to that growth. And I'm always right. <laughs> you better be careful. I'm going to I'm going to Facebook her right now. <laughs> no, no. She'll, well, I mean, she'll tell you different, but I know it, that my way is better and that I'm always right. <laughs> OK, so we're going to go ahead and remind everyone what we've talked about today, because I think we for a minute there, I think Brendan was ready to leave because we were laughing and making jokes and he was really having some good points. So I'm going to wrap it up here a bit and say we started this conversation really driving in on the importance of follow up. And then we went to the importance of work life balance. So Brendan, as a way to kind of start closing this out, what would be one tip you would give in follow up one tip? for the small business owner out there, and then one tip for really balancing that work-life balance. Uh, Well, it's it's a mindset thing. Um, Yes, it really does take that many touches to have (laughs) meaningful conversations with the people who, when they see the light, will be thanking you for interrupting their day. Totally. Uh, and, And that realization, might keep you from spreading yourself too thin, trying to get in front of too many prospects when you have just enough in your database, on your spreadsheet, whatever it is, to hit the revenue number you're going after. And only by spreading your, you know, by not following up with that targeted audience, you're going to spread yourself too thin. You're going to be pulling out your hair and yeah, you're not going to be able to unplug at five o'clock and focus on the people at the dinner table. Totally. So what I'm hearing is know who your audience is so that you can not spread yourself too thin and make sure you're following up with the people that are going to be able to move through the funnel and be acquired. Mm -hmm. And then if you do these things, you will have more time for your family and be able to set those boundaries you're talking about. Did, yes. I, did I do okay there? Indeed. I was, <laughs> even through the jokes, trying to take in the lesson. But anyways, thank you so much for being here, Brendan. Absolutely. We are going to send people in our blog to getting 98% of the, the people that aren't opting in to convert. So yeah. where can they find that again? Uh, yeah, so if you have a, a decent digital web presence or, or web uh internet assets and you're interested in not just continuing to convert the one two percent who are already converting on your sites but you know there's another 98 percent of the folks who are visiting your website checking out what you have to offer but for one reason or another fall off the path to doing business with you Mm -hmm. uh you can learn more about ways to convert that other 98 percent by visiting startinphoenix.com slash b2b leads and we'll put that link in the blog so thanks everyone for listening thanks for being here brendan it's wizardry yeah It is. It was a great topic and we really appreciate your expertise. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening to Small Biz Buzz. Please take a second to subscribe to the show and leave a five-star rating. It helps keep the show going. And if you need a hand with growing your small business, head over to keep.com. That's K-E-A-P dot com and get started. More business, less work. That's Keep.